Um, so, welcome to the AIPCT, the American Institute of Philosophical and Cultural Thought. This is the celebration of our first anniversary, um, and we have been in existence uh, officially uh, in the estimation of the federal government since December 16th of 2016, but uh, uh, we had our first inaugural le uh, lecture about this time last year, and Professor Larry Hickman, who was a member of our board, gave that. He's here. We have other distinguished guests, a fellow of the Institute, Myron Jackson is here from Michigan. We appreciate yeah. that. Hey. <laughs> and uh, I'll turn it over to the president here in a moment. Um, that said, this is the moment when we sort of tell you what we did over the last year. We have not been idle. Uh, pretty much all of the books, which is to say some 25 to 30,000 um, uh, volumes, are now in place on the shelves, which they will occupy more or less permanently here. And that has been, David, hasn't it? quite an operation. Um, it's a, it is no small thing to put 30,000 books in order. We are still creating our, uh, our database and our catalog eventually, and when I say eventually, I mean in about the next six months, the holdings will go up online uh, uh, so that anybody can see what we've got here. That, we have had two seminars. Uh, John Shook gave one of them in July. And, uh, and with a, w w well, I'll bring that up in a second. Charles Herman gave one in June, both very well attended. Um, and uh, Charles had two sessions, and you had, was it four? Yeah, four well, three. sessions. Three sessions. Can't remember how many. Um, we have had, we hosted the Han Lecture in July. Um, and we have had our resident fellow, where did he go? Oh, he's back there, right. exciting, uh, from Wilson, uh, has been on site, uh, uh, off and on, <laughs> for, uh, for the last year, and will be here until uh, uh, May or so, uh, this year, working on his dissertation. So all of those things are going on. In addition to that, uh, we will be receiving, uh, December the 8th, our first international uh, visiting fellow, uh, a fellow by the name of Professor Xu Tao from the University of West China, part of the translation group that Larry knows. Uh, and uh, he'll be here for a year and coming to the AIPCT. I hope you all get a chance to meet him. Um, in addition to that, we got our 501c3 status from the federal government. Uh, that was a process and uh, one that I'm glad is over. Um, and so <laughs> Uh, it hasn't been uh, a year that's, uh, that's lost. Um, also, I meant to bring a copy in here to uh, hold up, uh, but the very first book in our book series that John and I are editing in connection with this institute, which is called the Sunni Series of American Philosophical and Cultural Thought. Uh, its first volume came out, Crispin Sartwell's Entanglements, and we've got about five Five in the pipeline that'll be coming out soon, including Tommy Curry's new book on Josiah Royce, um, and uh, among others. Anyway, so it's been an active, an active year in the book series as well. Uh, there are probably other things to say, but I think that's enough for you guys to uh, uh, at least feel like you've been updated as to what's going on here in the last year. Uh, with that said, I am now going to turn it over to the president of the AIPCT, John Shook who's going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, uh, I have a short introductory biography to introduce our guest, but first a little bit about uh, why he got selected. Of course, I'm John Shook, and I'm really delighted to have everyone here. I'm the president because uh, I'm not sure why I'm the president. But anyway, I, I said I'd be the president. But, um, with that office uh, does not necessarily come having the right to, to pick the lecture. We sort of platoon and consult. But the consultation on who should be uh, this lecture, uh, our second uh, since uh, last year, uh, I think the consultation took all of about 40 seconds because I think, I think I said to you, it has to be uh, Larry Cahoon. And you said, oh yeah, it's got to be Larry Cahoon. And we checked with Larry and Larry Hickman was like, Cool. And that was the entire deliberation. We didn't even need secret ballots. So, uh, why though? Well, Dr. Cahoon has been on my radar for as long as I have been involved with American philosophy in a series of books that I'm going to recite. 
very impressive work. But for us, he represents continuity with the past. For you see, he represents simultaneously the Columbia University School of Naturalism and its allied Columbia School of Pragmatism wing. And of course, there's a lot of overlap and interest between them. He received his PhD with Justice Buckler, who of course was a product of the Columbia University philosophy department when Dewey was still there. So the continuity, the debt, it was an act of natural piety. Of course, we had to have you here. So enough about our decision to bring him. Dr. Lawrence Cahoon is professor of philosophy at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. He received his PhD, as I mentioned, from the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where Buckler was teaching at the time. He is the author of The Dilemma of Modernity, Philosophy, Culture, and Anticulture, The Ends of Philosophy, Pragmatism, Foundationalism, and Postmodernism, Civil Society, The Conservative Meaning of Liberal Politics, and uh, Cultural Revolutions, Reason versus Culture in Philosophy, Politics, and Jihad. His most recent book, just out a couple years ago, maybe, right, uh, came out. It's titled The Orders of Nature. Extremely important book. It was recognized by the Metaphysical Society of America. It received its very prestigious Jan Findlay Prize uh, for work done in metaphysics. And uh, it also received a historic <laughs> review by John Shook. He made me read that. <laughs> Professor Cahoon has also edited From Modernism to Postmodernism and Anthology. He's done two CD and DVD courses uh, available from The Great Courses, a terrific series. So you can see him lecture on uh, two of them, one titled From Modernism to Postmodernism, and the other one, Modern Intellectual Tradition, Descartes to Derrida, and uh, also Modern Political Tradition, Hobbes to Habermas, available from The Great Courses. He's also a playwright. His play is titled Wise Guys, a Philosophical Comedy, and you can go visit heartlandplays.com for a taste of that side of his literary output. <laughs> Please help me welcome Dr. Lawrence Cahoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's a real, it's an honor and a really pleasant personal honor to be in this place where uh, a group of people are trying to do something new, something new that holds on to the old, but that uh, pushes forward into the future. Mm. And I really appreciate you being here. I'm, I want to give my thanks to Randy Oxier and John Shook and Larry Hickman for inviting me. I especially want to thank <coughs> Gay Oxier for tolerating my presence in her house. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, it's just uh, uh, the American philosophical tradition is something and not nothing. And uh, the, the combination of cultural forces and economic problems in many places is draining attention from it. And uh, that would be a big loss. And uh, this is one of the few people, places where people are trying to keep it alive, critically alive, not just to worship dead white males, but to ask how do their ideas inform what America is and how America is to address universal philosophical problems that every society must. Anyway, I'm happy to be here. So, um, I have a handout. Uh, there are several uh, figures that go along here. Maybe if you just sort of pass on that side. There's no test. Um, there's just diagrams. There's five of them. Uh, I, I drew one up here, which is probably the most important one, figure two. But anyway, I'll just, just so that you can, as I'm describing, it might help you to look at something. So there's, so let's begin. <clears throat> Some people ask, are we alone? Are we humans the only creatures with our kind of intelligence in the universe? We don't know. But we do know that we did not used to be alone. 
It's important to remember that we did not evolve from the other great apes. We evolved from earlier members of the genus Homo, who evolved from an earlier Homo species, who evolved from earlier hominin species, who evolved from the great apes. Six million years of evolution separates our origin from existing primates. Up until 20,000 years ago, we cohabited the old world, Africa, Eurasia, with other hominin species in a kind of real world Middle Earth. Tall, thin Homo erectus, short Homo florensiensis, which paleontologists actually call the hominin, uh, and robust <coughs> Neanderthals with whom we sometimes made it. They're all gone, only we are left. We coexisted with them far, far longer than we, than we have been them. What makes us unique? There's no reason to think there must be one fundamental difference between us and all other creatures. There are, in fact, dozens. Homo sapiens are strange animals, large mammals with opposable thumbs, an omnivorous gastrointestinal tract, teeth good for grinding and tearing, feet good for quiet stalking, the ability to climb trees, run long distances, and swim. The other great apes cannot swim. Daylight color vision, from a head held aloft by an upright stance, leaving hands free, a larynx capable of nuanced vocalizations, in a sense more like a bird's than a primate's. Humanity's achievements are barely conceivable without these. But we are naturally interested in our unique mental abilities. What is the core of our distinctive humanity? And why did we alone, among all the other hominins, survive? Recent comparative psychology, paleoanthropology, and primatology have expanded our knowledge of human evolution and have suggested some partial answers to who we are. Remarkably, the American philosophical tradition, or what some people call pragmatism in the broad sense of the term, has special relevance here. That is perhaps not strange, since the classical Americans, like Charles Peirce, William James, and John Dewey, all took evolution very seriously. Of the major early 20th century philosophical traditions was the Americans, along with the process philosophers Henri Bergson and Alfred Nord Whitehead, who explored the significance of, of evolution for the philosophy of human being. In particular, we will see that the current work in human evolution by scientists like Franz de Waal, Michael Tomasello, Ramo Tuomela, Peter Hobson, and Thomas Sudendorf, among others, that their work converges on the ideas of one of those American thinkers, the Chicago philosopher of social psychology, George Herbert Mead. Mead and the other Americans suggested, against the current of most modern philosophy, that human communication is logically and temporally prior to mind. A human mind is not a thing, but a set of activities, which emerge through social interaction rather than the other way around. Mind is something we do, and social communication is its source. Mead's most famous innovation was the concept of significant gesture. Gestures, he said, are the communicative behaviors that many animals produce to enhance the process of mutual adjustment to each other. One organism responds to another's, by, uh, to another's act by a movement that changes the situation communicatively. Fido, rather than biting Rover, barks or growls. Rather than being attacked, Rover then shows a submissive posture. Each is a gesture. The gesture is, in effect, the initial phase of an act, like growling before biting, which functions to call out a response on the part of the other organism, like showing a submission, submissive posture. But, Mead argued, humans alone engage in significant gesture, a very different thing, gestures that function as signs. For me, a significant gesture means or stands for the later phase of the act. This grants the gesture objective status for others and for the self or gesture. Likewise, only humans can treat natural events as signs. To use one of Mead's examples, I walk my dog through the woods and we come upon a bear's paw print. 
The dog smells it, feels fear, and buries its nose in the print. It, it senses the print way before I do. What does it do? It buries its nose in the print. In effect, the dog is afraid of the footprint. I, seeing the print, feel fear too, but I respond by ignoring the print, looking up and scanning the horizon, because for me, the print functions as a sign of something else, the presence of a bear, and the bear is not where the print is. Mead argues that what allows humans to do this, to treat a gesture as a sign, is that the gesture responds to its own gesture from the perspective of the recipient. It does so implicitly, we might say out of gear, rather than explicitly. I can only send you a sign if I implicitly respond to the sign just as I expect you to do so explicitly, which I can only do, and I can only do that if I know what it is to experience the sign from your point of view. That is, the gesture must regard herself as an object from the viewpoint or attitude of the other. Mead writes, quote, gestures become significant symbols when they implicitly arouse in an individual making them. The same response which they explicitly arouse, or are supposed to arouse, in the other individual, the individual to whom the gesture is addressed. And in all conversations of gestures within the social process, the individual's consciousness of the content and flow of meaning involved depends on his, that is the gestures, taking the attitude of the other toward his or her own gestures. <clears throat> taking the perspective of others then allows, as Hume explains, humans to play and engage in games, which are very important for me. In, in, game, in, in play, each player must be capable of seeing events from the viewpoints of the other players in their roles. I play the daddy, you play the mommy. I play the patient, you play the doctor. You cannot be a shortstop unless you can regard a base hit from the perspectives of nine other players at more or less the same instant. In fact, for me, thinking itself is an inner conversation among the perspectives that we have internalized from social interaction. For me, the human mind just is the activities of significant gesture. Now, primate is the name for our biological order, but our family is the great apes. Once upon a time, there were four groups of great apes, today called hominid day with a D, hominid day or hominids, and those are the four, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. Some populations of these, probably chimpanzees, <coughs> began diverging into a new species, leading to you or I some six to eight million years ago. And here we go to figure one in the diagram, in which there's just a listing. This doesn't mention all the different kinds of hominins that have been discovered, just the ones most relevant to what I'll be saying. So uh, there are five broad stages in the process of evolution, of evolution to us. They are one. First of all, pre-homo hominins that branched off from great ape and ape ancestors. For example, Australopithecus afarensis, four to six million years ago in North East Africa, the first uh, fossil was called Lucy, if you're old enough to remember. Uh, what, Australopithecus walked upright into the treeless savanna, the first primate that could survive outside the forest. Followed by the next stage, two, the earliest members of the genus Homo, one example of which is Homo habilis, or the handyman, tool user, around 2.5 million years ago, still in Africa, with a significantly larger brain, around 500 cubic centimeters. Then, three, a much more advanced Homo stage, achieving a huge increase in brain size to about 1,000 cubic centimeters, double, named Homo erectus, who spread out of Africa across all of Eurasia and seems to have learned how to control fire. Then in the last half million years, Homo neanderthalus, 
uh, Neanderthals and slightly later we Homo sapiens. They're a little earlier than us, but it, we overlap quite a lot. <coughs> Uh, both species with the biggest brain-to-body size of any animal in Earth's history. But there seems to be one last step, because brain growth among Homo sapiens continued to grow towards its apogee 50, 80 to 50,000 years ago, at which time we evolved what people, anthropologists, call behavioral modernity, creating cultural artifacts like burial rituals, jewelry, and cave paintings. At that point, 80 to 50,000 years ago, we lived in hunter-gatherer bands with the full verbal linguistic capacity, art and religion, the form of all human life until the invention of agriculture and re recorded history a mere five to 10,000 years ago. So the claim is, the first claim is, by the time we get to Homo sapiens of 80 to 50,000 years ago, we have fully, fully recognized human beings that essentially can't be distinguished from us in any way. Now, what is so different from the other existing earthly animals, and um, what about us is so different from existing earthly animals, and from our hominin ancestors, which could account for our survival? Some of the most famous hypotheses for our essential mental differences are that we use tools, that we have language, that we have free will and moral agency, that we have self-consciousness, that we have reason or rational problem solving. Now, all these answers are partly true but limited. Other creatures do use some tools, and many have complex problem-solving abilities, which you can pull up on YouTube whenever you like. Um, and some great apes have been taught by humans to use sign language. Our goal, or my goal in this paper, is to find a small core of capacities which would seem to impact all these various abilities and account for the unique way humans excel at them. Based on relevant recent work in relevant science, I suggest there's three. And the first, most basic one, was diagnosed by meat. Humans are uniquely, so this is the first section, humans are uniquely social or prosocial far more so than even our great ape relatives. Humans develop simultaneously a cognitive and emotional ability to take the perspective of others, thereby changing their own perspective. We see this ability in our own children, in the phenomenon that Michael Tomasello and Remo Tuomela have called joint intentionality, which means when multiple agents attending to the same object actually share a mental state. That's the key to the joint intention of it, sharing a mental state. Say a human caregiver introduces an, an initially distressing object, like a wind-up monkey toy, to a year-old infant. Now, initially, the child looks at the toy in apprehension, and then does what? Looks at the caretaker. Okay? What does the, uh, what does the caretaker do? The caretaker smiles, smiles at the monkey toy, smiles back at the kid, handles it in a pleasant way, exhibiting her attitude of enjoyment and absence of threat. Then what happens? The kid starts to smile, and the mother or caretaker hands over the toy. Tomasello suggests that this is not merely a case of imitation. It's not just that the child is imitating the mother's behavior. The object has become acceptable by virtue of the child's taking up the caregiver, caregiver's attitude toward the object, which of course requires that the child first read the attitude of the caretaker, which is what cognitive psychologists call mind reading. Okay, it's nothing mystical. It just means figuring out whether you're happy or sad or what you're trying to do. Very young infants are constantly scanning the faces of caregivers for clues to the caregiver's attitudes and intentions. Tomasello suggests that the human child is hardwired to be motivated to engage, to engage to do so and engage in joint collaborative activities. While non-human primates are certainly capable of a limited form of mind reading, figuring out the attitudes of others, and as such, attributing perception or knowledge and goals to one another. Tomasello argues that the full mind reading of shared intentionality is uniquely human. A big issue here, by the way, 
is the ability to attribute false beliefs to another. That is, attribute to the other a perspective that's contrary to what you know to be true, which you and children only develop around four years. That's harder than other things. Along with that goes the ability to lie. It's more sophisticated. Um, our joint intentionality, doubtless dependent on brain size, you need a big brain to do this, but it also seems to grow out of our uniquely helpless childhoods and the intensive peer-bonded alloparenting we receive. That is, where fathers remain around to provide resources and other family members, often female, aid in the care of a mother's children. Because the caring for this helpless infant is a very uh, labor-intensive process. Incorporating and retaining the perspectives of others complexifies the self and the perspectives it can take. Peter Hobson calls this early identification and transference of attitudes the Copernican revolution of the human mind. Adopting others' attitudes sets up different optional perspectives in the individual mind. As Mary Warnock suggests, the possibility of taking up different perspectives is essential to having a thought about something. Thought is a time-traveling conversation. Time travel is another term of cognitive psychologists. It simply means the ability to see things from the perspective of the past and the future. Thought is a time-traveling conversation, a conversation in which participants move between present, past, future among socially acquired, imaginatively recombined perspectives. When I think, when I sit and think, I switch among perspectives on what has happened or might happen. Thinking, in that sense, is socially derived and can't be otherwise. Despite the surprising abilities of the other great apes, who have been observed both in the wild and in human environments, it's also remarkable what they cannot do. Young primates imitate their mothers, the chimpanzees, gorillas. They imitate their mothers and they partner up with other apes to gather food and share with their partners. But they do not do this. Point. Okay? If you do this to a great ape, they respond the way, the way a lot of animals will. They'll look at your hand instead of looking in the corner. In the wild, Mothers, great ape mothers, do not engage in pedantic instruction. That is, they don't do things in order to show the young how to do them. They do things in the young copy. They don't pick them up, now watch, and then do something. <laughs> and there appears to be an affective dimension to this. A mother chimpanzee is entirely capable, this is a little gruesome, of sympathetic as concern for her offspring and of fighting fiercely to protect it from other chimpanzees. But she is just as capable, a few hours after her infant has been murdered and eaten uh, by another member of the troop, to embrace her, she is just as capable of embracing her killer's, her infant's killer, and reestablishing benign social relations as if nothing had happened. That's also true. Jane Goodell herself wrote, quote, I cannot conceive of chimpanzees developing emotions one for the other, comparable in any way to the tenderness, the protectiveness, tolerance, and spiritual exhilaration of the, that are the hallmarks of human love." Unquote. Thus, there seems to be a kind of social relating with both cognitive and affective features that forms a key difference between ourselves and our closest living relatives. It appears the human mind does not merely involve or require communication in the coordination of activity, but is itself communicative. Non-humans communicate, of course, and are often social. But the human individual's very thought processes are social. My mind represents what others say and think. I incorporate and think from their perspectives. I take on their roles, converse with them internally, exchange signs with them, that arouse the same response in myself, a self which emerges out of my relations with others. The others are, in effect, in my head, whether I like it or not. And sometimes you can't get them out. This clearly leads to great possibilities for 
neurosis, but also for <laughs> collaboration. <laughs> but also for collaboration. Other primates certainly share and help foraging partners. They partner up and collaborate on group hunts like chimpanzees. But in those hunts, they follow a dominant <coughs> member. And when the hunt is successful, the dominant member takes his share, then the others scramble around and take what's left. There's no such thing as a provision of equal allotments. Among humans, I relate to you through taking your perspective, you do the same, and from this we learn to take the perspective of the we. And now we're starting to get into this. Think of it just as a baseball diamond. We at second base, I at first, you at third. And this is some object. We'll get into the rest later. But uh, I relate to you through taking your perspective, you do the same. And from this, we eventually learn to take the perspective of the we, or the social group that we're members of. This we is in, would be ensconced, or will be ensconced in far later moral philosophy as the impartial spectator of the philosopher of Adam Smith and the generalized other of me. I, with you, are members of a we collaborating in our joint attending to some object X. The magic in all this is that each of us while literally remaining the same individual organism, which must have its own single biophysical perspective. So my hunger or injury or death are really mine, not yours. So my, your eating doesn't cure my hunger. Okay? I'm still a different organism. But nevertheless, <laughs> we adopt and enact the perspective of the you or the we and juggle the meaning of X for each of those while recognizing its continuing identity. It's the same object, even though I know it means something different to you or to, and to me. Um, so we can now analyze these achievements of joint intentionality diagrammatically. So imagine a baseball diamond with X at home plate, I at first, we at second, you at third. Now imagine that X is some object, could be anything. I and you are two agents, and we constitute part of a we. So we is the combined perspective of you and I and the others in our social group, hence what stands for public or social objectivity, what is regarded as common. X can be recognized as, it, it can be the case that X functions as A with respect to I and functions as B with respect to you. That is, it means one thing to me and another thing to you. I use it for one thing, and you use it for something else. Okay? So, the stick serves as a bird in the hand of one child at play, or a spear in the hand of another child. The same stone can serve as a hammer for you, or a cutting tool for me. In joint intentionality, we acquire the ability to cognize the fact that one thing can have multiple functions in different relations. X can function as A or as B, seriously or simultaneously in different contexts, perspectives, or relations, and still be X. It's still X, and we know it's X, and we recognize it as X. We put down, you put down the object, you're no longer treating it as an imaginative toy. You still recognize it as what it is, even though it's lost the function. This implies the sign relation. X stands, X stands for A to I, or B to you. This is the beginning of the human cognition of meanings. Once we have a sign, which the American philosopher Charles Peirce defined as something which stands for something to someone, the meaning of the sign is, at least in practice, its function in a context of social communication. X functions as A, X means or functions as A to me, and it means or function as B to you. Um, okay. And that, for us to recognize that A or B are different, is to recognize the functions are also different from the X. Because the same X can be present when it switches functions. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, moving across the diamond figure, the I remember, comes to know itself by knowing the you and the we. In other words, I, part of this I'm going to argue, my self-consciousness is dependent upon 
My recognizing myself from your perspective, I can see how you regard me. And that also means seeing how we, the we, regards me. So once again, the taking the perspective of others is essential to my coming to have some notion of what I am or who I am. Um, the ability to take your perspective on me, see myself from your perspective, um, the ability to regard myself as an object, is what makes it possible, I argue, for us to be self-conscious. Humans alone, I argue, have what we call a self. Because having a self means having self-consciousness, I think. Non-human animals feel, have minds, are conscious, have characteristic behaviors and dis dispositions, but, I, but not, I believe, selves. Now, it's quite true that some animals have passed the famous mark or mirror self-recognition test. In these tests, experimenters take an animal and they put a little mark, sometimes with a tasty substance, on the forehead of the two <coughs> okay. Um And then they allow the animal to see its reflection in the mirror. Well, what they want to see is if it looks in the mirror and will reach to touch its own forehead once it sees the image. So they want to see if it will touch its own forehead and maybe eat the tree. Now, this is called the mark test. Elephants, dolphins, and magpies have, essentially, have occasionally passed this test. Only the great apes pass consistently, okay, repeatedly. However, even more than one half of them fail to pass it. So it's unclear. There's certainly other creatures that can pass it, but they don't do it regularly or routinely. I suggest that even success on the mark test does not by itself indicate the possession of a self. Certainly it indicates a recognition of one's own body, which is an important cognitive achievement. But in my mind, it's more akin to causal reasoning, as in recognizing that the movements produced in the mirror image are being caused by the movements of my own body. I think possession of a self is different and closer to what neuroscientist Antonio Damasio calls extended or autobiographical self-consciousness as distinct from core consciousness. So Damascus makes a distinction between these two kinds of consciousness. We all have both of them going on right now, but there are two levels of consciousness. Core, conscious, core consciousness, more basic, is the basic form of real-time waking present awareness common to humans and many other animals. Core consciousness functions to track my body state in relation to environmental changes that I perceive, enabling learning and complex control of behavior. But extended or autobiographical consciousness found in healthy humans does something different. It reads the results of core consciousness as owned by an historical agent or self, a narration of personal identity. And this requires a lot of episodic memory that is, when you can actually recall chains of events in their temporal order, okay? Not just see a face. The difference between the dog recoiling when the dog sees a man who has hit it the day before with a stick, okay? That's not episodic memory. Episodic memory is if the dog could recall the series of events. Yesterday, the guy came, I thought he was delivering the mail, he came in the front door, he picked up a stick, he did this. So remember scenes, in a, way, in a sense, tell a story about your past. That's epistotic memory. So this requires, this human, the higher, or uh, human self-consciousness requires episodic memory, the memory of a sequence of past uh, event stories, if you will, and imagining future possibilities. It's this, which humans usually call consciousness, in Damasio's terms, the self in the act of knowing. And that self-consciousness can be turned off by illness, for example, in epileptic seizures, while core consciousness keeps running. So persons in some epileptic seizures can walk through a crowded lobby, not bump into anybody, but not remember or describe or be able to say anything about anything that happened during that time. And I wouldn't say what their name is, can't do that. But they can negotiate and walk through. <clears throat> 
So I think the self-consciousness comes from some level of sophisticated application of joint intentionality, for it is bound up with viewing the self like an other while remaining the self. The self of human consciousness is, I think, socially acquired. Now there's a couple of other achievements that flow from joint intentionality, and these are two, uh, the third, if you look at the uh, figure three in that diagram, which essentially, that little diagram just takes this section and uh, adds a couple of things to it. Imagine for a moment in figure three that I, the letter I, doesn't mean a person, but it's an event. In this case, a goal we want to achieve. Now think of X as fulfilling or functioning in role A, hence leading to I. So I functions as A and that leads, um, pardon me, X functions as A and that leads to I. Recognizing that A, a function of X, is distinct from X makes it possible to substitute other acts or steps or things for X. That is, to get an A as if it were an event or stage on the way to I. So, the hole needs to be dug. Yesterday we used a flat rock, R. But if the rock is not here today, we might use a spear, S. Different but functionally equivalent causal intermediaries can be substituted for X on the way to I. What I'm arguing is this has something to do with the sign relation that came out of joint intentionality. Production processes like making a hand axe, which is very important in human evolution, require a necessary ordering of steps that result in an end. Tomasello points out that the great apes are, were capable of remarkable feats of problem solving, which require some recognition of causal relations, do not recognize the intermediaries of intentional or causal relations. They don't understand that the relation of, uh, they don't understand that the relation of antecedent and consequent, or stimulus and response, may entail an intermediate force or agent intention. Hence, the same re result might be produced by a variety of antecedents. So there's different ways to make the cake when you're lacking this ingredient. Because the only thing that matters about it, we're building something. We need to make it. We always use this. We don't have this. But what matters about this is what it did, the function it served for the cake. Oh, maybe something else can serve the same function, even if no, it's not that. So. And this kind of, this, I've actually said what I was just going to say. Uh, if you now look at the same diagram, and this time take the I to be the whole ellipse in figure three. Imagine I as a whole that has been achieved of built parts, including the part X. We may discover that when no X is available, R or S can be substituted, etc. Okay, the patch of fox fur can contribute to a dwelling or to a piece of clothing or perhaps to making a bag for carrying things. This is also true of social members who switch roles in collaborative endeavors. endeavors. Last week, you drove the prey and I speared it. This time, I will drive the prey and you spear it. S and R can serve as alternate parts falling under function or category A with respect to the whole I. Okay, that's joint intentionality. but there's something else, and that's called language. Human language is unique. No other living species has anything comparable. It's true that in recent decades, humans have taught a remarkable amount of American Sign Language to certain great apes, like Washu, Nim Chimpsky, uh, and Coco. Uh, most impressive of all is the Bonobo Kanzi, um, who you can look up on, you can Google and look at the videos of the things that Kanzi can do. Kanzi was taught by Sue Savage Rumbaugh. Uh, Kanzi can make statements by pressing lexigram figures on a keyboard, and Kanzi can even differentiate word order. In other words, Kanzi can distinguish between the sentence, make the doggy bite the snake, and make the snake bite the doggy. And that's a big deal that Kanzi can do. That. Now, this has to be, Mead was wrong in trying to imagine that no non-humans can acquire significant gesture of any kind. Got to be wrong. However, we have to note several facts. First, none of this happens in the wild, but only through domestication 
and intensive human training. So it remains the case that the linguistic events we're talking about only appear inside a human society. Second, even Kanzi's abilities are limited. Prepositions, connectors, conjunctions, disjunctions, subordinating clauses, and embedded sentences are, are beyond Kanzi's ability. Finally, the most remarkable feature of human language, I mean, when we look at what, when the question, do other non-human species have language? The question is always, how much which part? How much which part? Well, the ultimate top of the charts for humans is something called recursivity. We are capable, everyone in this room is capable of actually creating an infinite number of distinct sentences. And we know that because we can do it by just adding a phrase to any sentence we have. So, uh, nobody claims, we'll get into this a little more later, but nobody claims, so, in other words, uh, Mary lied to Fred, the sentence. We can say, we would say, is it true that Mary lied to Fred? Tom says it's true that Mary lied to Fred. Uh, Jack will in doubts that it is true that Mary lied to Fred. And you can just keep adding, which also notice involves you re-embed one idea inside another. So you get an idea and you put it in a new context. Mary lied to Fred. No, John said Mary didn't. No, Francine said it's true. You keep embedding. Okay, which uh, Thomas Sudendorf regards as an extremely crucial ability. Nobody claims non-humans have shown any sign of this. So the question of whether language is uniquely human is actually a question of which features of language, how much linguistic complexity is uniquely human. The current answer is still quite a bit is uniquely human. But what matters for us in the present context is what mental abilities does the uniquely human version of language signify? Philosophically speaking, something very remarkable happens here. Human language provides a means by which meanings can be treated and manipulated as objects. Meanings may be recognized in joint in intentionality, they certainly are. But language provides the device for handling them. So these meanings or functions, different from the thing, it's certain meaning B now or A later, we now have the ability, in, if we can put those into words, we can manipulate those meanings in our discussions with each other in our planning and collaboration. So, uh, me, uh, meaning manipulation allows us to do something remarkable, to objectify and communicate about meanings that are not actual, that is, that are not in the present, that are in the past and in the future. Particularly important is the ability to objectify possibilities. All human words other than proper nouns and all linguistic statements have meanings which involve what philosophers call universals or generalities, which are essentially cognized possibilities. To say just the fragment, sentence fragments, I say a baseball. We all know what a baseball means, but to say that is to refer to not one object, but to any one of a huge number of objects that have existed in the present, past, and the future could be instantiated by any one of those that we could pick up. Language is that most famous social device for allowing us to communicate about actual states and things through or in the context of non-actual or non-present possibilities. Thus, I understand the current X, say, a baseball, in front of me as a member of a category of things that are mostly not present, all of which grants a unique latitude of action or behavior. As Mead wrote, the human mind holds onto different possibilities of response, and it is this ability to hold them there that constitutes the individual's mind. Now, Thomas Sudendorf, this is what I mentioned a moment ago, Sudendorf further identifies cognitive nesting as a uniquely human ability. Uh, it's connected to recursivity. So this is now figure four. Almost done with the figures. This is figure four. If you just substitute the words that I use into the... Uh, into the uh, diagram. So 
I might say, using the letters that you see there in the, uh, in the smallest ellipse, I can say Robert lied to Zavion, but I can also say Sebastian believes Robert lied to Zavion, or even Ivan knows that Sebastian believes Robert lied to Zavion. That's the nesting or embedding. But this can also be applied to scenarios for action. So imagine a scenario for future, future action in which X, just imagine that X is a deer. Okay? So I might start by saying, today Robert will hunt X. Then imagine a modification of the situation. Sebastian could help Robert hunt X. Then new information comes along. Ivan says hunting a possum would be better than Sebastian helping Robert hunt X. Hence, on the basis of the outer ellipses, I decide to switch the ultimate goal, replace the X with a possum instead of a deer. Reasoning about nested possibilities of collaboration requires sophisticated verbal language and a set of signs that can only be used to hold and handle these possibilities. But let's turn to something maybe a little more poignant, uh, which is all this has emotional significance, which we are very far from understanding. We can turn from the distant to the recent past for a remarkable example, the famous passage in Helen Keller's autobiogra autobiography, in, when the blind, deaf, and speechless, nearly 77, nearly seven-year-old Helen suddenly acquires language while being taught by Ann Sullivan. You may know this from the classic film, The Miracle Worker, and actually the final or the climactic scene in that movie is fairly accurate to what she describes in the autobiography. So it's worth seeing the movie. Patty Duke, if you want to remember. Um, and Anne Bancroft. So the passage is long, but it's incomparable. So I'm just going to read it. So this is directly from uh, Helen Keller's autobiography written long later. The morning after my teacher came, she led me into her room and gave me a doll. Miss Sullivan slowly spelled into my hand the word doll, D-O-L-L. -L. I was at once interested in this finger play and tried to imitate it. I did not know that I was spelling the word. I was simply making my fingers go in monkey-like imitation. Two words. One day, while I was playing with my new doll, Miss Sullivan put a big rag doll into my lap and spelled D-O-L-L -L and tried to make me understand that D-O-L-L -L applied to both of them. Earlier in the day, we had had a tussle over the words M-U-G and W-A-T-E-R. Ms. Sullivan had tried to impress on me that M-U-G is the mug and W-A-T-E-R is what's in the mug. Um, I became impatient at her repeated attempts, and seizing the new doll, I smashed it on the floor. Neither sorrow nor regret followed my passionate outburst. In the still dark world in which I lived, there was no strong sentiment or tenderness. We walked down the path to the well house. Someone was drawing water, and my teacher placed my hand, it's one of those old outdoor pumps, under the spout. As the cool stream gushed over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed on the motions of her fingers. Suddenly, I felt a misty consciousness of something forgotten, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing through my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. Everything had a name, and each name had gave birth to a new thought. As we returned to the house, every object which I touched seemed to quiver with life. That was because I saw everything with a strange new sight that had come to me. On entering the door, I remembered the doll I had broken. I felt my way to the hearth and picked up the pieces. I tried vainly to put them back together. Then my eyes filled with tears, for I realized what I had done 
and now for the first time I felt repentance and sorrow. Okay. I think he could spend a long, long time trying to figure that what was just set out, but let's just spend a minute. <laughs> Her phrases are very telling. One, everything had a name, which has to mean had a name for us, for me and my teacher, for you as well as me, which also means when we say that name, you and I can think the same thing. That's joint intentionality enhanced by the mechanism of language. She says, and each name gave birth to a new thought, which means the something outside me, by having a sign to refer to it and distinguish it, is all also at the same time a thought in my mind. Something I handle. The water's in my hand, but in a different way the water's in my head. I have the idea or word for it in my head. The object is mine in a new way. Then every object which I touch seemed to quiver with life. Whatever that packed phrase can tell us, it must at least mean that the perceptual experience of the thing was now supplemented with a new emotional significance, connected, perhaps, because potentially shared by self and other. Somehow the word drapes the object with the, emo with the emotional charge of joint intentionality, which is a charge of, of sharing. And, and then, for the first time, I felt repentance and sorrow, sorrow. Only now is the doll a gift from another that mattered to you and I and to we. But this brings sorrow, too. Eating of the fruit of the tree of language gives us meanings, but not only happy ones. Feelings are, no, are now more intense, the pain and the joy. The acquisition of language has altered everything. But there's one more step required to get what we think of as fully human behavior, and that's culture. So, some claim culture is not uniquely human. This is because some scientists define culture simply as learning passed across generations by a local population of a species. Now that phenomenon, learning passed on from generations in a, local, in a local population, that's extremely rare in the animal world. Populations of an animal species are not especially different in their behavior. Even where a local population has learned something unique, it normally has no way of passing it on. Transmission of skill and ability across generations is by natural selection. That's the way evolution works. By genetic lottery plus natural selection, period. A big enough naturally selected genetic change and it's no longer the same species. So normally species don't learn or pass learning on. Only creatures with culture can have a history where their current life ways are different from the past life ways while they're still members of the same species. There, but there are a few non-human populations that seem to have done this. The most famous is a troop of macaques, a snow monkey in Japan, uh, who, uh, among, <coughs> alone among their species, wash their sweet potatoes in the ocean before eating them, presumably because they like the salt. And the point is, they, they started doing it, and in fact, it, it looks like they've learned it from people that were studying it. But anyway, <laughs> the, the point is the macaques passed it on, taught their children to it. Now, some scientists call this culture. But I would argue we need to distinguish culture from society. <laughs> society is a group of conspecifics who live together and are interdependent, such that they be belonging to a society makes a difference to the individual's behavior. In intelligent species, society may entail rules of behavioral propriety and intelligibility. But culture is not society. It's something society has. If society and culture were identical, no society could exhibit cultural change. It would no longer be the same society. And we would have to deny the existence of multicultural societies, societies with more than one culture. When the population of macaques acquired potato washing, its society had indeed changed and learned. But that doesn't mean it had a culture which changed and learned. Culture, I suggest, is something more than that. It is making things that mean. 
and more elaborately, constructing practices, artifacts, or narratives, making stuff, that are valued intrinsically as ends in themselves. People like to do them, and they just do them. If you ask why are they doing them, because they want to do them. Which realize shared meanings. They mean something to the group, usually expressing some beliefs about the world or about themselves. And lastly, in terms of which individual life, society, and the world are valued or understood. The beaver dam and termite mound are social products. So is the hominin, hand, axe, and bow. But the cave paintings of Lascaux, or the ornamentation of bodies and clothing, ritual dances, and narratives told around the campfire are different additions to reality. They are valued insofar as they mean something for members, which contributes to members' orientation in the world. They are cultural things. They include practices or rituals. Evolutionary anthropologists cite the great distinctiveness of behavior in ritual versus mundane, customary, everyday social coordination. During ritual use of light, in other words, even in indigenous societies, hunter-gatherer societies that we can study, uh, there's a big difference between the way people act during rituals and act um, during normal, everyday activities. During ritual, the use of language, sign use becomes narrow, loud, intense, highly structured, and repetitive. As of now, it appears, as of now, it appears that we Homo sapiens develop such constructions in what has been called behavioral modernity. That's that period, what's also called the Great Leap Forward, the period from 80,000 years ago to 50,000 years ago. Everyday spheres of communicative um, social behavior were augmented then by symbolic culture. If one wants to say this really means art and religion, I mean, that's what we're talking about. No other primate tells stories around the campfire, paints caves, or worships an icon of King Kong. So, and if we look at, if you look now at the last, the very last of the uh, diagrams, five, which is really just claiming that the we creates a culture that kind of encases all of this and allows us to interpret everything else. That's culture. So, uh, culture is clearly a social product, a product of the we, but it, rep it presents a new interpretive environment for the understanding and the valuation of the world, or X, and the I, and the you, and the we itself. Humans, at least at this point, if not earlier, begin to root their social order in a dimension of intrinsically valued, made icons, myths, and rituals. This doubtless adds to the already existing social bond. As Tomasello argues, the cultural era develops what sociologist Emile Durkheim called group mind. And as Gellner wrote, um, and as uh, Ernst Gellner, uh, the philosophical anthropologist, writes of Durkheim's conception of archaic society, this is Gellner talking, we cooperate because we think alike and we think alike thanks to ritual. That's his description of uh, hunter-gatherer society, which is the background for all of us for a um, couple hundred thousand years. But I believe culture is not just an intens intensification of the social bond. Things now mean something more than the direction of game, the likelihood of water containing roots, the coming of storms. They now mean that the world what the world is and how we fit into it. For the first time, I think, once we have this thing called culture, something is intrinsically valuable because of its meaning rather than being edible, sexual, or pleasurable. Intrinsically valuable things have been created in terms of, in terms of which much of the world is then to be understood as meaningful for human life. Now, with culture, a totemic animal embodies the spirit of me and my ancestors. The stars depict human scenes. My life and death play, take place in a normative circle of the four winds. Now my fertility and the fer fertility of my partner express the order of the world, the circulation of mana and power. There is no way to avoid saying that only with culture do humans organize their lives according to an understanding of the meaning of human life. 
an understanding of its function within the wider non-human world. I'm coming to the end. So it's time to summarize. I suggest that the mental behavioral capacities at the heart of what makes us human are three related but distinct ways of functioning. Joint intentionality, language, and culture. These may have arisen in chronological order. Why? And this is, could be completely false. Why? Because it seems to me that first, complex verbal language must presuppose joint intentionality, not the other way around. And second, the creation of cultural artifacts must almost certainly presuppose significant linguistic ability rather than the other way around. Now, by all means, language could have changed very slowly from simple manual signs to eventual full verbal recursivity. Nevertheless, it seems to me at each stage, it presumes gains in joint intentionality. Like Tomasello, I believe, my guess, is that joint intentionality of some level was characteristic of Homo erectus. With its tremendous gains in brain size, its control of fire, and its spread all over the world. Erectus must have engaged in novel forms of animal collaboration that the world had never seen before. I believe this was only possible with some degree of what has, I've described as joint intentionality. I think joint intentionality had to be involved in that. Homo erectus and its hominin prodigy, uh, pro progeny, uh, oh, also prodigy, uh, certainly Neanderthals, must have had some linguistic ability which gradually developed from rudimentary hand signs and etc. But there's some evidence that Homo sapiens, our species, had better linguistic abilities than the others, including the Neanderthals. My guess is that fully verbal language, such as has been characteristic of Homo sapiens hunter-gatherer societies, must have been in place in early Homo sapiens. That is, it could be that our species started out with special linguistic gifts. Lastly, it currently appears that culture, behavioral modernity, only arrived 80 to 50,000 years ago. It was only after this that Homo sapiens outcompeted and outlasted all the other hominins, probably involving a greater ability to adapt to novel climate change in virtually any environment. This may turn out to be false, but at the moment it seems to be predominantly Homo sapiens territory. At any rate, the combination of both complex verbal language enabling the handling of meanings and the exempl their exemplification in cultural products based on refinements of joint intentionality seem to make us unique. Okay, what does this do for our current understanding of ourselves? Well, potentially many things, but I'll just suggest two. One. If Mead and the current work on joint intentionality are right, it means that our rare cognitive abilities to be smart, figure stuff out, and our moral abilities to be moral, okay, derive ultimately from the same phenomenon, namely joint intentionality. They come from the same source. They're not two different things to two versions or applications of the same thing, joint intentionality what allows us to inquire into the world in sophisticated ways, and what allows us to control our social behavior morally are rooted in the same capacity. I mean, if Mead's right, that would be true. Two, it should be noted that the highly pro-social picture I have pointed is not anti-individualistic. There's no contradiction between our sociality and individuality. We are indeed more individualistic, that is more individually distinct and capable of novel, unique action than any other animal. But we are more individualistic because we are more social. I cannot think about myself and what I want to do with my life without having learned the socially invented language. Knowing who you are and how you are unique is a socially acquired ability. It's probably true that modern human societies, especially deriving from what we call Western civilization, are more individualistic than earlier in other human societies. But that is not because the species has changed, it is because culture changed. We have a shared, inherited culture of individualism. Either way, selfhood is established by sociality. At least, that's my point. Thank you.
Your choice. Speaker's choice. Maybe 15 minutes of it. Yeah. Yes. Excellent uh, paper. Very uh, fascinating. Um, I appreciate the uh, fact that you are not making a heavy break or a shift between the pre sapien and the homo sapien, so to speak. Um, my question um, has to do with, I guess, the speculation on more recent research that maybe me wasn't exposed to that you referenced in your talk. Um, with regards to um, how this relates to the physiology of the womb and the kind of joint intentionality that occurs between the mother and the child and how there's a kind of um, um, precognitive or preconscious level of development that occurs that is always presupposed in consciousness that really kind of checks. Are you talking this, about... Uh before birth or after? Uh, I'm talking about during the process of uh, before birth. Uh, in, in, uh, for example, uh, in the recent work of uh, uh, Bruno Latour uh -huh. and uh, Peter Sauterdijk. Yep. You get them talking about uh, this word, this notion sounds like a monstrosity. Uh, negative gynecology is what they call it. I wish they would come up with something else, but this, 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 is, this is the notion that um, mm -hmm. uh, that when as a as a as a being is in the womb, mm -hmm. it has a notion already of hereness and thereness. Uh, that is a kind of feltness rather than a kind of cognitive uh, uh, fermentation. Mm -hmm. And this uh, psychologist have tried to talk about how this shows up when the child uh, carries around a stuffy or a toy, or uh, they think of themselves as being protected mm -hmm. uh, by another one or over yonder that is there. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard you reference the doll uh, example, mm -hmm. um, but I was just wondering what you, since you're not making this strict break between um, the pre-sapien and the homo sapien, how do you account for how pre-cognitive levels or pre-conscious levels of development that are kind of presupposed in consciousness or cognition um, would be accounted for in needs account? Oh. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Right, so me, me, uh, so Mead's, Mead's uh, lecturing in the 1920s, uh, almost everything that I said is right out of the most popular collection mm -hmm. uh, of his, the, the book Mind, Self, and Society. Um, he did other things, but, but that's the most famous thing. Um, and so all this is before 1930, dies in about 1931, right about 1930. So, uh, f um, this is b before the age that uh, a lot of people knew much about. I mean, ethology, the study of animal behavior is just kind of being invented around the same time. There's a lot of stuff he doesn't know, and a lot of stuff he doesn't know about human reproductive health. Mm -hmm. um, all Mead's going to say, all Mead knows is and he's right as far as it goes, and is human beings, homo sapiens are species that somehow have the neurological equipment that allows them upon af after birth to a certain process, if they're exposed to the right things socially, to take the perspective of another and then to make gestural, significant gesture. So that's, all, that's his theory, that's all he really knows about. Personally, I don't know how much. How, I don't know what the uh, <laughs> the fellows. By the way, they refer to it as nested possibilities when you talked about that in your paper. Though. Well, nested pop, right? So this all and that. My guess is so the notion of nested possibilities, which is really a logical idea, mm -hmm. and it's really a logical it idea um, that we we're able to take ideas and put them in some kind of order. And then we learn something from that order. Anyway, that ability to nest ideas, right, that's uniquely human. Presumably, it would, I don't know how you would be able to do it, no matter how smart, no matter how smart a creature was, if it didn't have language, I don't know how mm -hmm. you could do it. It's just like saying, I don't care how smart you are, 
you cannot remember, unless you're uh, one of these extremely unique individuals with bizarre skills, you can't remember 50 numbers, but you can write them on a piece of paper and carry the piece of paper with you. But you can't remember all 50, you can't keep them in your head. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine trying to keep them in your head if you didn't, I mean, I don't know what it would mean if you didn't have a number system. How would you keep quantities in your head? So, until we have language, we can't hold on to things and nest them. So I'm thinking that the joint intentionality gives us a set of background capacities, but some of those you can't do much with until you have language. Mm -hmm. So that's my guess. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it was a really, really brilliant paper. I really like how it draws on like neurological and phenomenological, like relational. Um, ideas and I think something that I really appreciate that it did for me is I'm a big fan of Levinas mm -hmm. um, and his idea of substitution, you know, and like otherwise in being pretty difficult. One of the, one of the most difficult books I think I've ever read uh -huh. thus far in my life. Um, but I really appreciate your diagrams because I feel like they really like have helped me to kind of think through some of the, his ideas of substitution and substitutionality and infinite substitutionality. Mm -hmm. Like they really kind of flesh that out for me in this really fascinating way. Um, I, I just wanted to compliment. I don't remember enough Levinas to know yeah. what substitution, what substitute. Oh, he says like I the could, kind of like you can try or something. fleshing out like you know like the self and the other and the other as infinitely substitutional sort of for the self and this and and you know pretty much broadly the idea you know that that we become a self through sort of the mystery of the other you mm -hmm. know and and understanding the mystery of the other sort of shows our infinite you know kind of distance from our own self. Okay. Um, and then kind of the ethical idea that, um, you know, like all others are infinitely, I don't, actually I don't know if anyone else can help out with that still, but I, I didn't know if, I, I didn't know if you drew on some of those ideas, apparently not, but great job, no, great job. I don't, yeah. I, I don't, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I'm familiar enough to know, right, so this, the, the social perspective that Levinas wishes to impose on an otherwise Heideggerian position, mm -hmm. where, which is sorely lacking. Yeah. Um, right. In that sense, Levinas does have something in common with the Americans, just like uh, Mitch Abu Lafia's book was about what Sartre and Mead. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. there's certain there's members of the continental tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, I would, I'm not sure. I don't know enough Merleau Ponty on social relations. Right. But well, I would have hopes for that. Right. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, but, uh, right, so Mead's notion of, you know, it's typically, Mead's notion of there's not going to be anything infinite about it, so we, it's unclear how, how that shows up. From Mead's point of view, I'm, uh, it, it's very simple, that, and that's why he talks a lot about playing games. So, kids, you can't play games unless you can switch perspectives. You can't do it. And the play and gaming, the game is just more complex institutionalized forms of play. Play and games for me, it's the school for mind, really. Because it's the ability to take someone's perspective on um, what you're doing. Uh, and I would say that brings self-consciousness as well. So all this is... Yeah. yeah. I appreciate more concrete, like pragmatic kind of sort of examples and fleshing it out rather than kind of, you know, loving us pretty idealistic and airy. So I really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. I know many people who live and die with loving us. So oh, yeah. I would say oh, yeah, I'm one of them. But it's quite, but, you know, this is all. I mean, <laughs> it's, but, but they share this social notion of what makes us human. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go back to figure two, and this may be a, 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 an unfair question, because you haven't talked about dolphins, but I want to get dolphins in on this. <laughs> dolphins? Dolphins. <laughs> I was thinking uh, dolphins. Trust the ups. Can I have Oh, just, just this one? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay yeah. sure, go ahead. Okay, I talked to John Lilly, who wrote a book about uh, dolphins. And John who? John Lilly. The guy himself, okay. Yeah, okay, I talked to him about this, and... Uh, I see here a very interesting thing. Uh, for Lily, mm -hmm. the eye is, he's, he's got fish. And that goes up, I mean, between the X and the I, that's fish. 
between the X and the U, that's rewards. Okay? Where's the dolphin for the, well, am I making categories? Well, the dolphin is a U. The dolphin is over oh, here. Yeah. And the lily is the I. Oh, okay. Okay. Lily, dolphin. Yeah. So Okay, go ahead. The, so there's fish. The, the X is the fish. Okay. Right. And All right. for lily, uh, it's fish. Oh, or it's a reward, I'm sorry. Right. For the dolphin, it's a reward. Uh, right. From X to uh, U, and it's a reward. Now, we get up to the top there, the we, and John only told me that at a certain point, he's giving out fish as rewards, and the dolphin Maybe. Gets, gets tired of playing the game, and he takes the fish, the dolphin takes the fish, goes over to the other side of the pond, comes back and puts it on the side of the of the, uh, the, 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 the the pond. Okay. Which says, I'm tired of playing. Isn't there a uh, shared intentionality there? And if you want to say yes, then I want to say, I want to ask, where do the dolphins get off the bus? <laughs> In terms of the figures. <laughs> If, <laughs> right, so if it's joint intentionality, then I'm wrong. Obviously, the dolphin so, said, I like the rewards that you've given me as a fish, mm -hmm. but I don't want to play anymore because I'm tired yeah. and let's don't do this. Right. At least that's Lily's uh, story. Right, and, and let's take him at its word. Yeah, sure. But I'm not. Is the putting of the fish down, is, is that a sign? Or is it rather, I mean, if my dog is tired yeah. of the stick, yeah. the dog puts the stick down. Is that a joint intentional sign? See, Mead would think not. Mm -hmm. Mead would just wouldn't think that's it. It's not enough. It's no more a sign than a bark. See, for him, as, as we know. So the bark is not a sign. The putting the stick down isn't a sign. It's the end of the activity. Mm -hmm. um, that so the putting down of the fish, unless there was something more complex there. See, the putting down of the fish is the initial act in simply ending participation, right? But so, it does indicate uh, a participation in the game, right? They're playing a game together now, yeah. um, but uh, but I think again, if this is joint intentionality, then I'm wrong, which it would be the first time. Uh, uh, but, as I but, say, I'm just saying. No, no, no. I I, I know but what I'm saying. So in other words, it's not a discussion about nothing. There's yeah. there's yeah. something at stake here. Yeah. My tendency, unless I know a lot more, yeah, is to say. If you play frisbee with a dog, it gets tired, and then you throw the frisbee. And it's like, no. I mean, it just sits there. Now, were you playing a game with the dog when you played frisbee? Well, by any ordinary language term, yes. Is the dog switching roles? Is the dog doing the stuff that Mead says is characteristic of human games? I don't think so. Maybe, but I don't. But I don't think so. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, just wondering, wondering about some of the political ramifications of, of, of what you're doing, and, and you know, you're pointing out like the human uniqueness and all that only humans ourselves because of this joint intentionality. I'm wondering about the difference between the word self and agent, because you hear the word agency thrown around, like non human right. agency, and, and and so in what sense are non humans still political agents if they're not selves? Well, uh, personally, I would say non-humans are not political agents yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah. I, I, They're agents of some yeah, kind. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I, I mean, I would separate um, living things have a certain kind of agency. Uh -huh. I mean, I call it teleonomic. That's, yeah. I didn't invent that word. That's the word that's often used. It means 
the agent actually is working out a kind of genetic program. It has goals, but doesn't mean they're minded goals. Yeah. Okay, I mean the flower is growing in a certain way and is seeking the sun. Yeah. That's a kind of agency. Then I would say minded agency, like of vertebrates, especially you know mammals and birds. That's another kind of agency. I mean, I think your dog, my dog's an agent. Right. Okay, I don't think it's an agent with a self. I think the agent with a self then would be a moral agent too. And the dog doesn't, that's at least in my way of looking at the dog's an agent. That, that's okay, agency. But not the human agency, which is this moral self conscious agency. Not that humans are always self conscious or always characterized by free will or whatever, but they, it seems to me, are in a different ballpark. But is that what you were asking, or yeah, you're, looking, guess, you're going after I bigger fish? I guess the deeper to the question for me is like how we're, you know, just many questions about how we're responding to things like the climate crisis, and you know, when we are putting ourselves forward as the sole moral agents in this crisis. I guess it's it's like is that is that part of the problem? Is that you know, if we're not um, well, on the general yeah. issue. Well, on that. I mean, I would, just to speak on that question, which is a huge topic. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, um, right, it, following, if you take my line of thought where that leads, yeah. it means, right, we're the only moral agents on Earth, yeah. okay? But that doesn't mean we're the only, not, we're the only morally significant things on Earth. Right, right. There are things, we're moral agents, we mu doesn't mean we only have moral responsibilities to each other. We right. have moral responsibilities to a lot of other stuff on Earth. Right, yeah. So, but that means that they may have goods that must be morally respected. That's what we think of rights. But they have, they have goods that have to be morally respected. That's a whole other thing. And that would just be Holmes Ralston. I mean, that's the uh, evolutionary uh, okay. ethicist. I mean, not the environmental ethicist. Okay. So, right, we're moral agents, which is why we can't punish. Um, the chimpanzee for abandoning her child. Because it's not a moral agent. <laughs> okay? Uh, but we might, we, we can if we want publish poachers who are killing chimpanzees, if we take the view that there are some distinctions in complexity of mental, mental behavioral complexity among animals, which means some of them can be harmed and others not. Or that if they're going to be, they must harm, it'd be an awfully good reason. There's nothing unreasonable about that. Okay, so, by all means. And nobody else, right, so, if we are destroying our environment, okay, by pumping carbon into the atmosphere, we can't expect help from them. But we, or anybody else. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, there's that fellow at the University of Stirling in Great Britain who's done research on elephants and their experience of grief. And it look and, and this is the most convincing mm -hmm. stuff I've ever seen that elephants have selves um, uh, because because there's complex grief behavior uh, associated with, with with elephants. And it seems to me like it's it's one thing sort of to they, and, and even some burial behavior. I mean, right. uh, elephants are the, yep. the elephants sometimes bury their dead, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that one comes to my mind that if, if if an elephant doesn't have a self, <coughs> then then it seems like there's no self to grieve. But I would give us, but I would give. I mean, there's nothing to grieve. Um, you're going to have to posit generalized grief or something like that. Now, of course. People are going to say you're projecting grief onto this behavior, and I understand that. Another good example is dogs with shame. I mean, it looks like looks like dogs are capable of experiencing shame, mm -hmm. and you can always say we're projecting that onto them. But it does seem to me that at some point the evidence just piles up that there are that there's self consciousness of a sort necessary to grieve, self consciousness of a sort necessary to experience shame before the other. And, and as, as these things pile up, what you end up having to do is create a more and more ad hoc definition of what it takes yeah. to have a self. I, 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 I hear you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
I disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, it's not exactly, it's not that I, that it's, I would accuse you of human projection. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot, of, we will always be discovering more complexity in non-human animals than we think is there. We will also, at the same time, discover, well, then why don't they do this? Not the stuff we do, we do that they won't do. Now, um, I don't have any special, I mean, I know about the elephant burial. Uh, as we were right. Is it a ritual, for example? I don't think it's a ritual. I think it's a fixed action pattern. I think it's a behavior. I think it's a lot of, critters do a lot of things. I would ask, I think there's, let's put it this way, my, what, what I would do, I mean, there's these characters that I read who are scientists who know more about this, but I mean, my own thing would be that I think self-consciousness goes, ha, goes with certain things, okay? And Mead was, Mead was wrong. I haven't gone into how wrong. Mead thought you couldn't have a mind without significant gesture. Well, that's, that doesn't make much sense at all. That doesn't make any sense. Um, you have a different kind of mind <laughs> with significant gesture. He thought signs, significant gesture, meaning, recognition of possibilities, all of that, that's all one thing. Mm -hmm. And we have it and nobody else has. Well, that's false. Why can't we just say there's a different kind of ritual with the elephants? Though? You really like using the word ritual, you can like the uh, well, dung beetle with I mean, its mating ritual. Obviously, you don't want to just make it a semantic difference. I use the word ritual this way, you use the word ritual that way. No. Uh, but it seems to me like uh, your argument depends upon postulating a difference and then justifying the difference. Let me, let Whereas mine would be seeing a continuity and then justifying the continuity. My, my argument is going to be easier than yours. In, in the sense it's, it, that it's so much easier to draw positive continuities than it is to say, no, here is a real line. It, it is always easier to say everything is one. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I was going to say is uh, the, I think, self-consciousness in the Damasio sense go, is literally like it involves, you can't have a self unless you've got a narrative history. In other words, you've got to have a set of memories, episodic memories, and a projection of your future. You've got to have all that. Now, if it's the case that the elephant which experiences real sadness and suffers like many other mammals do, at the death of a family member, and that it scuffs up ground and pushes in and puts leaves on top, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't expect them to have picks and shovels. Are they then somehow doing something that externalizes a series of memories? I remember when he and I first went into that watering hole. I remember, is that going on with this elephant? Is the elephant, the only way we know we go on with it is we have these cultural things that put them actually <coughs> symbolize and realize those meanings. Now, if you, if you want to think the elephant is, but I don't, I doubt it until I'm shown, okay? It's just like I'm, uh, you know, and it's better and worse to be a human being. I mean, we know we're going to die, as a certain tradition in 20th century philosophy has made a great deal of it. And they, they are, we don't put you, but it's, it's all true. I mean, we know we're going to die, um, and you know, we suffer from that and live with that in a way that I don't think the elephant does, even though the elephant is completely capable of feeling the loss over an individual. And that's another thing, too. There's recognition of individuals. And that's most mammals and a lot of others can recognize individual members. Then feel. So, I mean, 
to me, what goes together with the self is the self-conscious, self-consciousness, episodic memory. There's a list of things that go with it, and I would have to ascribe those to it. It seems to me, not, not, not to continue to pick on it, seems to me like you've got in exactly what you described, rudimentary self. Um, uh, and, and I would want to say self-consciousness is there too, it's just not developed in the same way. And I remain, uh, I, I'm not convinced that non-humans have self-conscious selves, but it wouldn't follow from that that they don't have selves at all. Uh, they have uh, they have selves that are formed by other modes of communicative yeah, interaction. You, 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 they you, have they have unalienated selves, yeah. whereas we have alienated ones. Um, right. I would drop the alienated uh, personally. But the, <laughs> the 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 well, in other words, we have. I mean, our the kinds of selves we have are entirely capable of being alienated. Mm. They're also capable of utterly committing themselves to a course of behavior that is utterly opposed to our instincts and our physical well-being. And that's not alienation, but it's also purely human. So we, 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 we do some weird stuff, good and evil. Okay. So, so that's, I just mean, it's not just that we're split, you know, uh, and friend them from ourselves. It's not just that split thing, but it's also that humans are capable of deciding, no, I'm going to put all that aside and do this. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree. If you want another word, I'll, I'll if somebody, if, no, because you, I understand the, you know, uh, Eretzim Kohat, who comes from somewhat the same tradition. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, he would say, what do you mean? They're persons. I mean, they're not, you're calling them they're not selves? The woodchuck person. The woodchuck is <laughs> my friend and all that stuff. And, uh, and the woodchuck, you can, it, 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 woodchuck's hard to be friends with. It, but, <laughs> that's not, but, no, no, I, but I don't, what are we saying? I don't know what the right language is. The type of thing we call the human self is not present. Now, if you want to say, there is nevertheless not just a minded animal agent, but this mind has itself a certain character. Is it, I mean, I'm not, I'm not against that. I will say, whatever we say, there's going to be a continuity and there's going to be a line. There's going to be a distinction. And there better be a distinction. There has to be a distinction, and not because for the Victorian reasons that we don't want to believe we're animals. We are animals, as Aristotle did. 2300 years ago but we are also weird animals unless we want to start putting the elephants in jail when they do something bad because we say they're morally responsible but we don't want to do that and we, we don't have, want to we have executed elephants publicly right public in public executions India. of elephants for being bad I know was it a good idea though <laughs> yeah yeah. Is it a good idea to execute anyone publicly? <laughs> no. I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. All right. <laughs> anyway, it's time, John, for you to rescue our speaker from me and others. <laughs> he done good. He done good.